Wow. So at this point, I'm basically just thinning it down. Things will come around if we take this top of it. Hi, I'm Matt. I'm with Boulder Outdoor Survival School. Uh, and what we're going to talk about here this early afternoon is uh, hand drill fires. We're gonna go ahead and make a fire. It's about tea time, so I think we're gonna boil up some water and make a, a natural tea. Uh, and to do that, we're gonna use a hand drill set to light the fire. Hand drills are a very, very universal, very ancient way to make fire by friction. Some of the benefits of using a hand drill over a bow drill are that it's much simpler to make. Not as many moving parts, not as, not as fidgety. On the flip side of it, one of the cons is, is that it takes much more practice and really perfect materials and perfect form to be able to, to perform hand drill reliably. Okay, so here are some various iterations of a, of a hand drill set. Um, what I recommend and what I teach in the field is usually starting with some sort of spindle that's going to be usually about from armpit to wrist length. Much longer than that and you get too much play at the top. It's almost like trying to spin a, uh, a car antenna or a radio antenna with your hands. It wants to whip around. So any longer than that is not ideal. Shorter than that's going to be a little bit harder for someone who's just learning. Um, and the materials that I'm using for these, these spindles are generally some sort of flower stalk that has a pithy center. And this one's been used so it's a little harder to see. Um, the other component that we're looking for is what we call a hearth board. So hearth board are these three items here. You're looking for generally things on the softer side than you would for a bow drill. Um, so something like yucca or our local material and my personal favorite, this is the root of a cottonwood tree. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and do a, a demonstration. With anything fire, it doesn't matter whether you're using a match or a lighter or a ferro rod or a hand drill, Proper prior preparation prevents piss poor performance. That's the old military saying. So everything that I want to make a sustainable fire needs to be ready to go before I even start putting this in, into, uh, into service. All right, so we've got our tinder bundle at the ready. We've got kindling and a fire lay ready to go. So I'm gonna get a comfortable level position, get myself in a nice comfortable tripod. And I'm actually gonna wet my hands slightly to give me traction on the spindle. Seat my spindle. And then I'm gonna start warming the board. So what I'm doing, this technique, is what's called floating. Floating is kind of a modern aboriginal innovation as far as I can tell. But it is very, very useful. The reason being, I don't have to migrate down the spindle and then very quickly move back to the top, I can just continue spinning just by adding a little bit of a rocking motion to my hands. I can keep my hands stationary and I can actually warm up the board and start creating. You can see already that I've got a notch full of dust and it's smoking pretty heavily from around the periphery of the spindle. It's not an ember yet. I'm basically just building the heat and I'm budgeting my energy. At this point, I've got a full notch and I've got some good heat. So I'm gonna go ahead and start adding a little bit more speed and downward pressure. You can see I just have to move my hands back up to the top really quickly. And now, I have an ember, and the reason I know that is because that smoke is coming from the pile of fuel that I've created. And so at this point, I'm actually not in a hurry. A lot of people see that ember and they get excited. They're tired, they're out of breath, their hands are shaking probably. You have time with this. What I'm gonna do is gently pull the board away from the ember. And I'm gonna just let that ember coalesce into a, a nice solid material. So right now it's basically just a pile of powder, a pile of dust, but if I just gently fan it and introduce some oxygen, you can see 
it starts to glow. So I want to bring my nest to my ember. At this point it's held together well enough that you should be able to gently lift it up without it falling apart. And then I'm just going to tap it in, dump it in to my tinder nest. And here's where this little glowing ember becomes a flame. So it's got more fuel to grow into, but it needs oxygen. So I'm just going to start gently blowing on it. All right. To make tea, one of the things that we're gonna use is pine needles, which has a lot of vitamin C. We have what's called brigham tea or ephedra tea, and that's a little bit of a stimulant, and then some uh, elderberry, and this is a little fruity, and they kind of counterbalance themselves. So there's some wild tea brewed on a fire made with a hand drill. What we have here is an A-frame poncho shelter. Uh, to start with, you want to make a very taut ridge line. I've connected it between two trees here. Uh, in general, you want to start at at least waist uh, level in height. If it's lower, it's going to keep you warmer. If it's higher, it's going to be a little bit more spacious for you, but you'll also have more wind flow through it, so it could be a little bit colder. Uh, on each corner of this, you want to pull out from the grommets to about a 45 degree angle, once again making sure that your ponchos are very taut so that you can have water slide off of this and wind not blow your shelter everywhere. So making sure that things are, are really tight is important in any shelter, but particularly for an A-frame. Um, I've gone ahead and also tied off the hood, tied it off so that no water or precipitation gets in, but also tied another piece of P-cord to the hood, extended it to this nice tree behind me, once again creating even more tension in this poncho. Uh, with two ponchos like this, you can fit about three people inside comfortably. Uh, the more you put in there, the warmer it's going to be from shared body heat. Uh, but two people, one people, one person, this would be a great size for any of them. So. When you're sleeping directly on the ground, the biggest problem is the heat transfer from your body to the cold ground which wants to rob you of all of your heat. An easy way to take care of that is to build up what we like to call at Boss Duff. And this could be anything from dried grasses, leaves, pine needles like we have on the ground here, boughs of trees would do. What you want to do is create insulation to get yourself off the ground and slow down that transfer of heat and allow it to kind of sit around in those empty air spaces, those air pockets in the duff below you. So now that this is all set up, my shelter's taken care of, I'm going to go walk the area and look for resources that I can use uh, to eat and use for other crafts that I have in mind. When we're in survival situations, we don't oftentimes have a book telling us all of the wild edibles of the area. But those types of food may be really important in your diet if you're only living off of, let's say, mice and a few greens. So uh, if you're testing a new plant, the first thing that you want to do is take a tiny bit of it and rub it on the inside of your wrist. And then you want to wait a number of hours to see if you have a reaction. If you don't have a reaction, you believe it to be something edible, perhaps you take the tiniest of bites, put it on your tongue, leave it there for a few seconds, and then spit it out, and then rinse with some water. See what happens after a few hours if you have anything going on. If you don't, then maybe you want to take a tiny piece, chew on it, actually swallow it, take it down with some water. Uh, if you don't have a reaction within a few hours, go for a small but larger gathering of that plant. Have that then wait a full day and see what your system actually does. Anything that gives you diarrhea, anything that gives you an itchy throat, anything that causes a stomach ache, maybe that food isn't even poisonous, but it's new to your body. And if it's causing you harm, you probably shouldn't be eating it. But that's kind of the progression. All right, so here we have a ponderosa pine that has been struck by lightning, actually. Um, a couple things that are great. 
One is we have all of these fantastic pine needles on the ground. Nice duff material, right? So we would gather all of these, perhaps in a large cloth, take them to our camping site, and have bedding material. When we take a closer look at this pine, we actually find that there is a lot of pitch wood on here. And we remember that pitch wood is great for flames, for making fires and holding on to it. And then throughout all of this, we're, we're looking at sap, basically. Um, sap has a lot of uses. I will take um, pitch and fill in different wounds that I have, cuts, things that are bothering me, just to patch it and be done with it. And then the pine needles themselves out here, these larger pine needles, are very high in vitamin C. So when you come across a tree with green needles on it, you can take off the needles and then make a tea that's great, tastes good too. It's a little bit sweet. So this is a great, great plant. This is a big sagebrush. Its foliage is a antimicrobial. So just by rubbing this in between my hands, sort of like hand sanitizer, which is fantastic. If I take a bunch of it and have kind of a pile of it, we're looking at some fantastic toilet paper. And when you look at the shape of this particular one and you find some of the larger examples, you'll find nice straight pieces that don't have all of the kind of curvature of an older sage. And this is what I used for my bow drill fire kit was pieces of sagebrush. Um, it also has some nice peely bark on it, which we know is really great for nest material. So a lot of uses from a big sagebrush. Nice, so this is a good example of something that's getting close, but not quite what we're looking for for a sharpening stone. Uh, the sandstone out here works great to sharpen our Scandinavian bevel knives anyways. Um, but you want a very flat surface and you of course need to get to the grit that's appropriate for your knife. These would rip them up and not quite a flat surface. Can you grind but, them together to flatten it out? Yeah, you can do some grinding um, for sure to, to flatten it a bit, but it is nice just to get the perfect stone. Nice, flat, easy to carry, um, and we have so much around that if you keep your eyes peeled, you should be able to find something naturally. So when we're looking at sharpening stones, a nice place to start might be in a bit of a, a wash or a drainage like this where there's been more abrasion from water. Uh, and so you can find smoother pieces, flatter pieces, potentially something that you could actually sharpen your knife against. Consequently out here, we also are able to find a lot of siltstone, um, which we use for our socket rocks very frequently. It's grindable, but holds enough durability that your spindle isn't actually going to burn into your hand and through the rock. Yeah, getting there. So another thing that's great about these larger slabs of sandstone is that they work very well for creating deadfall traps. So this isn't a good size or anything, but you can see that it's fairly flat in surface, so we should be able to have a solid drop against another hard, durable surface and really compress and compact that animal um, for a death blow. And then there's also a little bit of texture to it, so I might be able to get my bait sticking a little bit of a nook without having to use a knife tip or something like that to actually create, create a, a little notch on the bottom of my trap piece. So our sandstone slabs work very well for deadfall traps. Uh, we have some examples of milkweed right here. So I use this plant for cordage material. This is a first year stock. What we need to find is a dead second year stock. So this is a small example, but it is um, a second year stock from a milkweed plant. So what it can do is crush the plant all the way up to the tip. Open it up. Take one half. Bend off all of this hard stuff we don't want. What we're looking for is the fiber right here. And you just peel it off. Once I've gotten all of my fiber clean, I can twist it. Get that piece 
Pause up. Using a reverse wrap cordage method. And ultimately come out with some rope. So I mentioned that the hand drill and the technique for the hand drill is deceptively simple, and it is. It's basically rubbing one stick against another. But when you, when you get into trying to do this and learn this, especially as a beginner, it's extremely difficult to, to get the technique down and the muscle memory, and also just the, the, the hand toughness, essentially. You know, it's, it's hard on your hands, and it's also hard on your muscles. There's muscles that you're using to do this that probably never ever get used for really anything else. So you, you have to kind of develop those muscles over time and build up to it and not, not burn yourself out in the process.